So SJ, I think a lot of Divi users are probably familiar with your work. I mean, we featured a few of your tools and plugins on Divi Nation already, um, such yeah. as your Divi Child Theme Builder last episode. Um, Which but, I have to thank you for featuring, by the way, because uh, there's been like <laughs> 200 people use it since it was on the uh, on the podcast. So that's fantastic. Fantastic. Now, so, so that's really so that's new. Cool. So that's really good numbers for how new that tool is. Yeah. So we know your work. Now we want to know you. What's your story, man? Okay, so I kind of fell into this by accident, really. I um, when I left school, um, I joined the army. I just I said to myself, uh, about seven years old, I watched my auntie join the army, and said, right, that's what I'm going to do. So I kind of almost switched off a little bit in school because it was like, I don't I don't need to know this. I'm going to go in the army, and I kind of <laughs> you know, and that, and that, that's what I did. I went in, and five years of that, I kind of found out that there was lots of that stuff that I liked and there was lots of that stuff that I didn't and actually it's probably not something that I want to do for 22 years. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at things that I could do outside of that. Um, the natural sort of migration for me was to go into sort of security work so I started looking at um, setting up my own company that did CCTV and sort of basic security sort of you know mall cop sort of security stuff. And um, so I did that. And one of the things that I did is obviously when you're starting your own business and you're working on a budget, you have to do your own stuff. So I started doing my own marketing, which is really where I sort of fell into the, the social media stuff and working out how you, you get good at marketing via social channels. Mm -hmm. And it was where I fell into the kind of web development stuff as well. So before that, probably my only interaction with development was through my phone. So I'd done a few things on sort of building... Um, different software, different operating systems for my phone. Oh, cool! Um, through with the, uh, through a website forum, and um, that was probably my only experience. And I went to kind of build this website. It was on Wix. It was kind of you know the most basic of basic <laughs> websites that you could get. But I really enjoyed it, and I found that actually that this is something that I really like doing. So alongside the social stuff and the marketing stuff, I realised that was the part of the business I was most excited about, and the security stuff not so much. So I managed to get a job um, through kind of almost a made-up CV um, with this company that did um, marketing, and I sort of learned as I was as, as I was on the job, really. Um, and then I went from that into another company called MRM, who are um, a really really great financial services PR company in London. Um, and the guys there were, you know, I, I, my boss there, Michael, was just fantastic and he was really good at kind of teaching me as, as we went and we just kind of built up this um, this small unit, the digital part of that company we, we created between sort of Michael and myself into into what it is now. And I kind of went, okay, so there's parts of this job again that I like in the same sort of scenario that I had before. There's parts I like and there's parts I don't. The parts that I do like is the web development and the social media stuff. The parts I don't like is the having to get up at six o'clock to make it to London <laughs> by nine o'clock, having to finish at London at six and be home by nine o'clock. It was kind of like I was seeing my children for about five minutes in the morning and, and not at all at night. So. Mm. I decided that the thing to do was to start my own company and that's where kind of Gritty came along. I was doing it alongside my stuff at MRM for about six months, just kind of dipping my toe into the water to see how I got on. Managed to get a couple of retained clients, enough to give me kind of that confidence to go, okay, well, I'm going to do this full time now. And then about four months ago, that's what I did. So I just kind of, I, I, I went into the office, I quit my day job, said thanks for everything. Um, and, and I've been doing this full time ever since. So, And uh, obviously you have worries when you quit a job and you sort of go freelance. You go, okay, what if no one likes me? What if I get no clients? What if I don't make anywhere near enough money and my family starve? Um, but, you know, I got over that quite quickly. And um, very um, luckily, my old boss was actually one of my first clients. So it's great to have that kind of boost in, in your confidence that, you know, your old boss is willing to kind of mm -hmm. put money into your new business. Um, and he hired me to build um, a website for a company called Greedy Goddess. Um, if you're going to Google that, it's greedy with an IE. If you if you Google it with a Y, you get lots of porn stuff. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> we'll get the we'll get the exact <laughs> yeah. uh, URL from yeah, the you. Right we'll put in the video yeah. description. <laughs> that's, that's probably safer. Um, <laughs> 
yeah, so he hired me to build that. I built it on Divi, um, shared it with the community, got loads of positive feedback about the fact that, you know, through CSS and things like that, it just looked completely different to anything that most people had seen before. Um, and that almost became the best referral tool I could have done because um, I got so much of my, my work that I currently have now through that website because people were messaging me um, on Facebook or sending me emails and saying, look, we've seen the site, we love it, could you build us something similar or could you do something with this site? Or I'm trying to do that thing that you did with those people on the front mm -hmm. on my site, can you show me how? So probably about 50% of the work that I got in the first sort of month was through that site. So That's fantastic. You know, yeah, and it's um and it doesn't look like it's slowing down and you know, we're in the last quarter, which is usually I hear I, I'm still learning, so you know, <laughs> I hear that's quite a slow time for developers normally. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think it can yeah. be. Yeah, and, and we're still busy, you know, so I'm positive for for two thousand and sixteen and to see what we can do next year. Yeah, that's great. So uh just to uh, retrace those steps. You went from high school to military to security to financial services to websites and social media to specifically WordPress. That's quite the trajectory yeah. um, with very, you know, very varied trajectory. Um, and it sounds like the common thread was that you just sort of kept, you know, following what it was that you were interested in until you got to sort of the root of it and then stayed there. Um, was, uh, I'm I'm curious because I actually have had kind of a um, what would look like on paper is a varied directory, but there's that same kind of common thread. Um, have you found that there are experiences or skills that you took from each of those um, stages and that have like stayed with you and and become applicable to what you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. I think that. There's no job that I've had in the last sort of 10 years that I can look back on and ever think of negatively because I've taken positive things from all of those. And if you go back as far as even the army, um, I wouldn't be having a conversation with you like this here um, without the army because before the army, I completely lacked confidence. I just couldn't kind of get the courage to kind of go out and, and believe in myself to do something. If the, the one thing that I took from that is that, well, there's two things. One is show up on time. And I think that that's important in any job. <laughs> Um, and the other thing is just to kind of really have confidence in yourself and project yourself in the best way possible. And I think both of those things are really kind of imperative in any job. Um, and then going through to kind of, I wouldn't have got to the final realization that actually I love web design and stuff. When I was younger, I used to love drawing and I'd do, when I was in the army, I did tattoos for friends. So th there was always kind of this design element or artistic element to my life, but it was never kind of focused on any one thing. This brings together so many of the things that I love so looking at code problem solving kind of taking something that just doesn't exist I love the whole creation thing where you, it doesn't exist before you touch it you know if you even if you look at WordPress and Divi you install a blank Divi and it's a canvas you know there's mm -hmm. so much that you can do with it and you just kind of you get to go right okay I drew this thing on paper a month ago and now it exists and people are visiting it and it's kind of it's making a company money and I think that's really really good and it's just something if you'd have if you'd have asked me you know all that time ago whether or not I'd be doing this I'd have said absolutely not if you'd have asked me even a year ago that I'd understand this code and be able to look at it and go okay well that's good that's good that's wrong it's like the matrix you know you look at CSS <laughs> and you kind of know exactly what it's going to look like when you put it on a screen I'd have never ever thought myself in a position to kind of do that even a year ago so it's um you know it's exciting I have to keep reminding myself I'm 27 not 37 because <laughs> that, kind of, that whole sort of backstory seems to have taken up more time than it should you know yeah, well, uh, to the point of the CSS and you know, saying just one year ago that you would have ever thought that what you're doing now and what you're able to do now is possible, you know, that's actually something I think has happened or has been a theme in every conversation I've had on Divi Nation so far is that yeah. everybody's like, you know, I, I'm even just reaching out to people because their name is everywhere in the Divi community. Like the, I've only messaged people or had people on the show who other people in the community have been like, this person's doing good stuff. This person's um, business is, is rolling. Their tutorials are great. Their community is great. There's something special about each person um, insofar as their interaction with the Divi community. Yeah. And for that to be something that's like 
potentially just a year away for anyone who who has the the wherewithal to plug in and really commit themselves i think that's incredible i mean wh- what other i mean there are a lot of other communities that that's probably possible in but i i don't know that you know there's always well, I mean, as welcoming or as um many resources and, and things available for people who want to do that um as there is with wordpress and divi i think there's definitely um you know other careers and other communities where it's possible to kind of have that learning curve and and learn quite quickly but I mean the biggest point from what you just said for me is that other people are recommending me so you know these are people that are in in all relative terms competition they're running Mm -hmm. their own web design companies and stuff like that oh yeah but but we're still happy to recommend each other because it's like the the feeling of community overcomes even the feeling of competition and I think how many I've seen that over and over again. And yeah, you're right. That's really a cool thing about, about, um, both WordPress in general, I think. Um, but specifically the, the Divi community seems to be very, I mean, nobody blacklists or tries to hide somebody else. It's everybody's promoting each other. It's, it's really cool. Um, Yeah, it's, it's great. And, uh, some of the people that I've met within the group are now, you know, almost business partners that we, you know, we share that many things. We, you know, they'll put work my way, I'll put work their way. They'll be too busy one week, I'll be too busy the next week. And it's just kind of, it passes yeah. between each other. You know, from from a client's view, it would be hard to tell where one agency ends and one begins because there's so much integration there within the community. I think it's really good. Yeah, which brings us to our main topic, I think. Uh, the idea that, you know, as a community, as individuals within the community, you know, we're going to be getting business. We want to make sure that we're handing off the best products to our clients. And if there is a way or a process to get our current best work to another plateau or another level. So taking good to great when it comes to our websites, um, I think we should all be interested in that. So that's, that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about for the rest of the interview. Um, However, in order to get to that point, I think to put that point in context, it might be a good idea, you know, if we're talking about mastering the final 5% to clearly define, you know, the first 95%. Um, yeah. So in other words, you can take it from here. What What is merely a good website? So I think a good website does its job. So, you know, you, you, you go on there and, you know, technically there's there's nothing wrong with it. You know, everything works. Buttons that should click do click. They clearly look like buttons. Um, You know, the navigation works. You can clearly find things and, you know, you follow a trail. Um, Again, back to that storytelling thing, you can kind of go from one point logically into the next step and then logically through to, you know, Mm -hmm. your call to action or or what what is the action that you want that user to take. Um, I think that's a good site. I think if it doesn't do that, then it's not a good site, it, even if it looks fantastic. If it doesn't do that and it doesn't allow you to logically follow a step through to what you want that person to do, then it's not a good website. So what do people do to take that website from good to great? I think you have to be really, really harsh with yourself and you have to be very, very honest. And I think that's quite difficult is because... Um, Every website is your baby a little bit, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You kind of you have to sort of step back from it and look at it objectively. It's like somebody else telling you that your child's naughty. No, they're not. They're an angel. You know, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no way they are. And you have to go step back and go, well, he is hitting that other child. I think it's the same with your website. You have to kind of step back from it and go, okay, what can I do to ensure that this is kind of better? Now, with anything within WordPress or within Divi or Genesis or any other major kind of platform, I think one of the issues that you'll come around to is that even even with the sort of the extensive options that there are to sort of change and edit things, is that things can sometimes look samey, and you'll you'll see mm. kind of a website and almost be able to tell exactly what it was made with, even down to kind of the plugins that we use. Sure, yeah, I see that all the time. So I think the first thing that you have to get right is to is to not design anything on your computer and not think about a theme or anything at first so get your pen and paper out and just sit down and actually design stuff like you would if you give a kid kind of a a project to go and design your dream house you don't sit them down with bricks you know you sit them down with cardboard boxes and paints and tin foil and slides and there's slides coming out the window and you know there's a ferris wheel on the roof and stuff like Mm -hmm. that just say to yourself what is my dream website don't think about the limitations of any theme or any platform and just say okay what does this look like and how does it work in an ideal world if i was the best coder 
that ever existed and I could build anything in, in 10 minutes, what would I build? And then get that onto paper. And then kind of be honest with yourself and say, okay, like, of that, what am I capable of doing? And kind of almost try and rein it into what is possible. But mm. always keep that paper there and come back to it and refer to it. What I see a lot more, because people are kind of fighting for, for websites and fighting to win projects and having to lower their price, is that they can't really afford to include a lot of planning time into a project. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't have that time and you don't take that time, then you're going to be fighting against yourself for the rest of the project. Yeah. So if, if you start, if your planning process is literally, okay, I'm in Divi Page Builder and I'm building pages... I think you've done something wrong. I think you're doing yourself a disservice. It might seem like you're saving time, but that last 5% is going to be a lot longer if you, if you approach things that way. So, so almost the first 5% kind of sets the tone. for. I was going to say that sounds like the first, what you're describing is, you know, don't skip the first 5%, i.e. the planning. And then when it comes to the final 5%, you're, yeah. you're wanting to, to what, compare the two? Yeah, so compare what your kind of what your dream house was to compare to, you know, what you've built and say, okay, so what are the things that I can do and start looking at things like your CSS, start looking, okay, that design had this and this is almost that, but what can I use? What can I use? You know, CSS is quite good at kind of just making it's the makeup almost of a website mm -hmm. and you can say, okay, this is going to like be the tweaking those with, standards yeah. that you talked about where you yeah. can see like, oh, this no longer looks like Divi because this divider is now tilted or slanted or has some type of variation on it or something along yeah, those lines. exactly. And it's kind of even down to things like in the design, it was an arrow that took you into the blog post. And then because the read more button is there in Divi, um, mm. I've just kept the read more button because it was easier. And just, just take the 10 minutes to kind of learn how to turn that read more button into the to, to the arrow that was in your design because all those little things made up a beautiful thing yeah. so you should try and include as many of those in, as possible in your final design so I think um, that's important I think with the page builder um, you've almost got your kind of your HTML and your JS being taken care of for you um, with the animations on kind of images and stuff coming in you don't really have to worry too much about that the same as PHP I think the functions that are built into Divi and WordPress are almost enough to take you where you need to be but it's the CSS that will make the difference between a website that looks like Divi or looks like any other sort of platform that you're using and looks like something that's you. So you, the good designers out there, the Melissa Loves, the Genos, you know, you look at their websites and you can tell that they're them. You can't tell mm -hmm. that it's Divi because they have a specific style and it's, the, it's that style that is the reason that people go to them yeah. and, pay, and pay good money to kind of let them build their sites because they can see they know what they're getting before they get it, you know? And, and let's not forget that with going from good to great, you're also taking your price scale from good to great too. Exactly. Um, which is huge. I mean, that's a big deal to a lot of people because honestly, you know, I, I know we've got quite a few more items on the 5% to cover, but w when you yeah. take it in its totality, it's, it's not actually that much extra work. It's just a, it's just a smarter process that results in a better product that results in a higher paycheck everybody's happy at the end of that. Yeah, and I think if, if you build a website like you're building it on a budget, you'll only ever get paid budget prices. Whereas if you build it like, you know, this is going to be, build it like it's your own site and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. this is going to be the thing that represents you as a web designer for, you know, the next two years. Right. Um, and then I think then you can really see the difference between kind of a, a good website and, and a really, really great website that does the job. I think the CSS is probably a big one for me personally because it's something that I'm quite passionate about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think for anybody, it's worth taking the, you know, Code Academy courses. It's worth getting onto those and the CSS ones if you're not comfortable with it. And you're it's starting a CSS it. class pretty soon, correct? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I floated an idea out sort of to, to our community and sort of said, okay, so I've got this idea of a course. It's almost like a Code Academy course, but specifically built for Divi. Oh, nice. Um, and, and whether or not there'd be any interest in that. And it was purely kind of speculative at that point. It was just to see whether or not it'd be something people were interested in. We put an email out there and said, you know, um, if you sign up to the email, we'll let you know when the course is available. And I think when I, t when I checked just before we did this, I, we had something like 400 signups. So there's obviously a kind of thirst yeah. for that kind of thing. All of the the feedback that we've had on it has been really positive. 
um, you know, a barely an hour goes by during the daytime hours when somebody doesn't message and say, so any more news on that course? And to have that sort of thirst for information, it's almost like, you know, they, they want to market for us and kind yeah. of take that post and go, okay, when's it going to be available sort of thing? So I think we weren't expecting anywhere near that kind of positive feedback and it certainly reflected the amount of work that we're putting into the course. It's kind of grown into this kind of mammoth thing that can take anybody from you know, just kind of, I don't know anything about CSS, so I know quite a bit about CSS and Divi, but I still want to kind of mm -hmm. design things that are maybe, you know, that next level up. That's awesome. I, w I want to get back, because I don't want to lose track of our time. I want to get back to the, yep. the list of things. Um, what is the list of things in the 5%? What is the squint test? Can you explain that to me? Yeah, so this is kind of, um, you can call it the squint test or the drunk test or, you know, it's up to you. But it's kind of this thing where you kind of close your eyes and you make sure that everything's really blurry. And you look for the things that are on screen that really stand out. So on a good website, these are going to be your call to actions. So your, your buttons, um, your forms, your email subscribe modules and things like that. On a bad website, you're just going to see a white screen. So mm -hmm. I think just close your eyes and just look for the things that are obvious because... People don't, we're in 2015 now, you know, there is a lot of information going out on the internet. There is a lot of websites for pretty much everything. People just don't read like they used to. It's not like, you know, you can just have a HTML page with lots of information and people will read it. They won't. They'll scan. They'll scroll and they'll stop scrolling at things that capture their attention. And these things need to be the things that convert for you. So... If they're not, then you need to look at your, your design again and say, okay, so why don't they stand out? And you can look at, you know, how to make them stand out. So it's silly things like you can have 10 things in, uh, in a header navigation. So the thing that you really want to push people to, turn it into a button, make it a different color, make it really stand out, you know. Um, don't just have a subscribe module sort of halfway down the sidebar put it at the top of the sidebar, make it a different color, put a massive bit of padding around it so that, you know, it really stands out and it's its own block. I'm not a huge fan of the kind of the pop-up um, opt-ins that literally pop in the, the second you've kind of loaded <laughs> a page because it's the, it's the equivalent of someone standing in the way of the TV, isn't it? You don't actually look at them. You just kind of look around them and you yeah. kind of, you, that's what you do. You, you, you close the box and you never, you, you never look at it. You've never read yeah. it and you couldn't, you know, you don't do anything with it. So I think that's another thing is just do, use the squint test. Make sure that your kind of your call to actions stand out. Um, I think the other thing that probably doesn't happen as often as it should is is a good proofread um, mm. and going through. So a lot of sites you go through, and I don't know whether or not it's because we do a lot of content, but I'm one of those people that will go. <sighs> And I'll judge a site if it's got kind of <laughs> obvious spelling mistakes. You know, there's one thing to have kind of different spelling for the UK and the US and things like that. And, you know, that's fine. But when you've got obvious spelling mistakes, especially in the first paragraph or something mm -hmm. like that, I got a, rather embarrassingly, I got a message on Facebook the other day to say that there was a typo in our Facebook page description. And it was kind of like, oh, man, <laughs> you know, that's, that's quite embarrassing, especially considering it had been there for about four months and no one said anything. I'm like, cheers, guys. <laughs> you know, it took four months for somebody to tell me. But, yeah, you know, just sit down, properly proofread your site first yourself. Then accept that the more you read stuff, the more you're not reading it. So step away from your computer, go for a run, have a bath, do something else. Just don't worry about it you step away long enough that you've forgotten what you wrote and then read it again and once you're happy pass it on to somebody else that you trust mm. preferably someone quite finicky and kind of you know uh, that likes things perfect and say okay you know do your worst and just look at their feedback and you know try not to take it personally and just go okay you've got typos there there and there and but not even just typos but does this make sense yeah is this conversational does this follow a flow is this something that you would read from the top and still be here at the end? And, sure. and just take their feedback. I know it's quite hard when other people kind of comment on your stuff and you go, what, what do you know about it? Kind of, and you, you can get quite defensive, but just don't. Just kind of step away from it. Forget you wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I do is um, on, on, on any website or any piece of content, actually, is kind of step away and then come back to it as if a client has given me this from another agency or another competitor and asked me what I think of it because you're so much better at scrutinizing other, other people's, people's work and, yeah. <laughs> and finding fault in it, you know? So you'll really kind of get to the nitty gritty of what's good and what isn't. So I think that's important. 
What about navigation? Do you have any hard and fast rules for your navigation? Um, I don't think I have any hard and fast rules. I, I think one thing's important is that people shouldn't have to go to sort of three clicks in to find the information that's kind of relevant. You know, say what you are and what you do on the front page above the fold. Just say it out there nice and big so that people, if they're not going to go any further, they at least know who you are and what you do. Um, with things like call to actions, I think be no more than one click away. If you're trying to convert people to a, a subscribe module for your blog, for example, don't go into the blog and then into the next blog before you find a subscribe module. Don't have it you know, at the bottom of your sidebar where people may never scroll to. It's the same for share buttons, you know, put them at the top of your blog rather than the bottom, or both preferably. So that, you know, people, if you look at sites that really are good at converting, so BuzzFeed, Mashable, and things like that, share buttons are at the bottom and so are the subscribe modules because they know that that's where people, you know, spend the most of their time. They get it done quickly. I think other content that is relevant shouldn't be more than two or three clicks away. But again, I think it's about telling that story and about what's the natural flow. So, you know, going from um, your portfolio and then listing the services that you provided for each of those clients is a natural segue for a link into your services section. Going from your services section is a natural segue into kind of who you are and why you provide these services. Mm -hmm. So just think about the natural sort of navigation. Again, this is where paper comes in handy is actually just to sit down and do kind of a link map of, okay, so if I'm on this page, where else could I go? How am I going to get there? And how am I going to kind of make that natural? Yeah, I think something Melissa and I talked about last week was um, think of it conversationally as well. You know, I, I think a piece of paper with like just topic boxes and the idea or the metaphor of a conversation will go a long way because the idea that, you know, if you're meeting someone in person and you want to tell them, who you are, what you do, and then at some point convert a sale, that conversation is going to have a rhythm. It's going to have a few steps to it. What are those steps and what might that look like if someone lands on your webpage and has that conversation with not you, but your website? And I think that's a good way of looking at it as well. Yeah, and you, you, don't, you don't talk in bullet points, do you? But so often <laughs> you see these things just in bullet points on people's websites. And you wouldn't introduce yourself like that. Yeah. You know? And just one of the things that I do, especially when I'm blog writing, is, is get my phone and record myself talking about the subject and just get all of the ideas out, especially the bad ideas out, and then kind of just sit down and listen to that recording and say, okay, so just almost type from the recording and say, okay, that was good, that was good, that was good. Because sometimes it is hard to write how you talk because you never really listen to yourself. So just recording yourself and then hearing that and sort of mm -hmm. making sense of that and getting your thoughts into some sort of organized you know, format is probably a good thing to do on, on any piece of written content, really. Speaking of devices, um, what do you do for multiple devices and multiple browsers? And is that also part of the last 5%? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you should be um, a hoarder of devices. So I never ever sell old phones. I've got kind of a drawer full of stuff that I just use for testing. You know, I grab my kids tablets and give me that. I need it. And you know, <laughs> I'm going onto the website and I'm having a look and I'm going through. I'm turning it landscape, I'm turning it the right way around. I'm dragging, you know, I'm I'm resizing my window and I'm dragging it from really really big to really really small and I'm seeing what happens at those different jump points because it could look fine on your phone it could look fine on your friend's phone and then your other friend that has literally a 10 pixel larger phone um, it just looks crap on and you think okay so how did that happen so get used to kind of sliding your browser along so that you can see every kind of um, you know every possible device size imaginable use Chrome development tools to get yourself into the different devices. If you go onto the inspect element and then you've got a little icon there with a mobile on it, you can then go in and you can not just change browsers um, and throttle your speed. Throttling speed's another good one as well. So you oh, okay. should remember that a lot of people are on mobile and they're not necessarily going to be attached to Wi Fi. So, what happens to your site when you're on a lower internet speed? And it's like, holy hell, that looks terrible because, <laughs> you know, it all loads bizarrely. Um, you know, the stuff that should load first doesn't. Start playing around with the order of your CSS to make sure that, you know, the stuff that's above the fold is, a, is the first thing in your style sheet and, it, and it's loading, you know. Start looking at the way that you've got files loaded. 
um, where your JS is, if it's in the header or the footer, just things like this are going to be the difference between how your site loads on those kind of slower speeds. Mm. And, uh, you know, and just little things like that can make a big difference to kind of the final thing. It, there are huge websites that I look at and, you know, are owned by multi-million pound companies that I, I just can't stay on. I, I, I sit waiting so long for it to load on my phone. I go, no, yeah. I, just, I, I can't <laughs> be bothered. That happens you know, a lot to me when I'll get I'll see a really fascinating article and maybe like the first paragraph will load and I'll read it and then literally the experience is so bad I'm so fascinated in that but I can't bring myself to stay yeah to stay for you kind it. Of, people just people aren't going to fight to read your content anymore you know you yeah. have to make it so easy people choose the path of least resistance and if you're if you make any resistance at all in, in between you and your con uh, between them and your content you're yeah. just going to lose them and you're never well, going to There's just convert. so much competition yeah. too i mean it, 9 yeah. times out of 10 if that happens i can google the headline and see five variations of it that load of the same article yeah, yeah. or it, google is your best and worst friend because people that are coming to you organically are f firstly they're going to kind of believe that you're good at what you do because you you came the top of google for what they were searching mm -hmm. which is great but secondly you're probably one two or three in a list of you know 225,000 articles that kind of came up as hits and if your site doesn't load they're going to go to the next one and if that site doesn't load or doesn't look right they're going to go to the next one yeah so you need to make sure doing things like speed tests, like using the Pingdom tools to actually do speed tests on your site. Mm -hmm. um, if it comes up and goes, your site was one of, you know, the, is the 87th percentile for kind of page speed, well, that's not good enough. You know, that's <laughs> as, uh, out of 100 people, I'm not even on the front page of Google in terms of page speed. So that's not good enough. You want to be looking at the top 5% at least and kind of go, okay, this is where I want to be. What can I do to make it faster? How can I make sure that, you know, it, it works on different devices? The amount of um, code that I see being shared, especially CSS, that just doesn't have the browser prefixes included in it and you think okay so that's going to be great and it's going to look fine if you're on Chrome but what if you're not what if you're on Firefox what if you're on an old version of Internet Explorer mm. you know um, it's good for, to see for those who don't know um, and who are maybe new to CSS can you just explain browser prefixes to everybody real quick most people will yeah. but I think a lot of people are wanting to get involved and that might be something yeah. they don't know so um as standard, your, your CSS is designed to work on, on a browser and it works with Chrome quite well. And then each browser will have its own prefixing. And the reason is is because they've got other things going on and they want to make sure that everything works right within their systems. So you've got kind of WebKit, you've got O, you've got um, you know, Microsoft, you've got even with Edge coming out, you know, they're trying to move away from prefixing. But you still need to remember that a lot of people won't upgrade to Windows 10 for a long time. So mm -hmm. you still need to think about Explorer, which is just kind of, you know, people hate Explorer, especially developers. It's kind of like, you know, a standing joke and that with good reason. Um, so these things just make sure that your code works, not necessarily the same, but as well as it can. So it won't necessarily look exactly the same on um, Firefox or, or Microsoft just because you've used those prefixes, but it will behave the best that it can and you mm. can make differences so um, I can adjust CSS specifically for Internet Explorer or specifically for Firefox because I know going into those browsers um, you know that they're going to be different but I can at least try and make sure they play the best that they possibly can just having those browsers installed so there's absolutely these these things are free you know so there's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't have everything from Opera, Firefox mm -hmm. um, Explorer, Edge, and everything else that you can on a computer or a device in your house so that you can test these things on different browsers. When things don't work as well as they can, you know, um, just try and make adjustments to that specific code so that they do work a little bit better. If you're not sure if a piece of CSS requires a prefix um, or needs one, you can go to, I think it's caniuse.com. Um, yeah. which will which will show you kind of you know whether or not the CSS needs a prefix to work well on on different browsers so just take the time to do that it might just take it might take an hour it might take a couple of hours to do and it might seem like a ball ache while you're doing it but it's going to be the you know if you look at the browser numbers we all love chrome and you know i i, I love chrome um but it's not the only browser out there 
you know, yeah. and you need to take into account the other ones when you're building a, a site. You'll have a client that will be on an old version of Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer. Almost definitely you'll have a client that will just look at things through an old version of Internet Explorer and say, the site you designed for me is crap. And, you know, it might just be one client, but you need to keep these guys happy. So you need to do the best that you can for, for all of the uh, all the browsers. So we'll recap in a minute, but what else is on this uh, 5% list? And I, we've jumped around a bit, and we've definitely gone <coughs> deep on a few of them, so I want to recap in a second. But um, so far... We've covered a bit. What what are some of the last things on that 5%? So I think the last one and probably one of the most important ones is before you put a site out, before you hand it back to a client and you say, okay, are you happy? Ask yourself, are you happy? Hmm. Because there'll be little things that you kind of let slide, little niggles that will just eat at you for the rest of your life if you send those back to the client and he doesn't notice them and you allow that site to go live knowing that that thing doesn't work properly. So you'll say, you'll, you'll, you'll say, all right, if the client finds it, then I'll kind of, I'll address it and I'll do something about it. What if he doesn't? What if you send that site out live and you know, you've got your footer um, links at the bottom of this site and people are judging you on this piece of work? Again, we've talked about people kind of knowing you from lots of stuff that you do and people that only have one example of kind of knowing who you are. Mm -hmm. If this was that one example, would you be happy with that? Or would you feel like you'd have to call that person up and go, look, come and let me explain, you know, <laughs> I'm, not li I'm not like that. You know, uh, I'm better than that. Um, so I think, yeah, always make sure that you're happy. Hand it over to somebody that you trust or preferably somebody that you don't get along with that's going to be quite happy to tell you all of the things that you're doing wrong and kind of somebody that knows what they're doing as well so another designer or a developer again with Divi you know the community is huge you're not going to struggle mm -hmm. to find somebody even if you just post links out on kind of the Divi theme examples page on the Facebook page and things like that then you'll, you'll get the feedback that you need to make sure that that site looks and acts well on different devices again it comes down to that you may have done the normal device tests which you know the latest iPhone the latest Android um, tablets and, and desktops on different browsers but these guys will all be coming from kind of different devices from weird kind of little Japanese models that there's only 500 of in the world and mm -hmm. you know way up to kind of every other device on the planet so they will find the things that you'll miss it's worth doing that about a week before you hand the project back over just so you've got enough time the worst thing you can do is literally you're, you're giving it to the client in two hours and then you post a link to your friend saying hey can you can you check this because so when they come back with the inevitable deluge of kind of information that they need you to change and you're kind of like well I don't even have have time to do that now and you end up putting out a site that you're not happy with yeah and you know you kind of am i going to put that on my portfolio am i not going to put that on my portfolio every site you put out you should be willing to kind of link to from your site and say i made that yeah absolutely so just to recap we've got these items in the final five percent comparing your final product to your initial paper design, what you sketched and what you what you ended up really liking on paper. Yeah. Um, performing the squint test to make sure you have um, prominent items such as your call to actions and your navigation placed uh, prominently and where they need to be. Um, you wanna have one click to all of your most important call to actions or services or pages and then no more than two clicks for everything else. Uh, you want to make sure someone proofreads. You want to make sure you browser and device test like crazy. <laughs> and, and, and speed test. And well. speed test. Sure and then finally, you want to get some feedback and refine your site before it goes live. Yeah. And give yourself the time to act on that feedback and don't just kind of, okay, now I've got loads of information that I, I wish I knew you know, mm -hmm. a week ago. Well, speaking so. of time, I mean, does that ever become... I mean, obviously, if... Uh, um, you're only getting feedback at the last minute, time's going to be an issue. But in general, how does taking these this last 5% that we've just described um, or the final 5% of a project, how does that impact the way that you plan and schedule future projects? You know, say someone hears this episode and they go, this is great, I'm going to do these items on every single project from now on. How's that going to impact their their process in general and what are some kind of changes they need to make to other areas perhaps like such as pricing and other things to make sure that um, this this process remains you know worthwhile and profitable to them 
Well, I think um, I think one thing that we are all guilty of is being very bad at kind of estimating how long something is going to take. We kind of we see it in this almost rose-tinted glasses where we go, okay, this is going to go right and everything's going to go well. <laughs> the kids are going to go to school on time. They're going to come back happy and go to bed like they should. I'm going to have loads of time to do all of the stuff that I need to do. And then the reality kicks in. You go, well, actually, that project that I did last week still has some changes, and the one that I did the week before still has one or two things that I need to do. So I'm not actually going to start this until a week later than I thought I would. And you just kind of just be realistic with your timing. But also say to yourself, like for me personally, the first 5% and the last 5%, we're talking about workload, not time scale. I think mm. just that 10% should probably be about 30% of your allotted time for that project. And that gives you enough time to truly plan. So an example of a, a site that I'm working at the moment, I've given myself two weeks to plan that site. And I think that's a realistic time. So I know people that are knocking out websites in two weeks from, you know, cradle to grave. Yeah. And I th- that I would just be flustered to try and fit <laughs> everything that I need to do in that time scale, you know. So uh, with the the first five and the last five percent, I think it's very easy to have a couple of things on the burner and kind of be able to step away from one project and work on another one for a while and then, you know, and vice versa. But I think it is important to give yourself enough time and say, okay, so if you think about it, that even if I stepped away from this for a couple of days just so that when I come back, I'm looking at it fresh. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're looking at a week there to do that, and you're going to want to do that at least once in the planning stages of your website. So give yourself that week or two weeks to properly plan a site, to hand that back to the client and go, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And it actually looks like you've put some thought into mm-hmm what you're going to do for them and this isn't just the kind of a, a a template that you've kind of pulled out of your back pocket and you've got ready to go you know you've built this for them and yeah. i think a, a client will appreciate that and the other thing as well is just little touches so uh, to and fro with the client or with whoever you're building the site for saying i was thinking about this and what do you think about this and just involve them as much as you can in the process even when we build plugins and things like that it's never a kind of ta-da moment it's not something that just comes out and it is there now mm-hmm. we are constantly going back and feeding back into kind of our friends and other people using Divi and saying okay so you know what are your gripes what do you need help with what would be easier if you had something that could help you do this and all the way through we're kind of we're, we're putting things out and going so how does that sound we're pulling it back we're saying so how does that sound we're refining it and then we're putting out a final product and you know you, you see the same from Nick and his team as well you know yeah. we come oh, okay what would what would make life easier this would make life easier this is what we're currently thinking about does it look good pull mm-hmm. it back in then a final product so don't be afraid to kind of have a to and fro with you know the person that you're building the site with um but yeah. yeah plan 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 well it looks like we're running up against our our time limit um but at the end of each episode i like to ask every guest i'm sure you've seen by now to leave us with a parting thought that sort of encapsulates their take on our topic so obviously the topic today if they're if you're listening or watching you couldn't have missed it but i'll repeat it again <laughs> <laughs> mastering the final 5%, um, taking your website from good to great. So my final question for you, SJ, is, you know, why should people care about mastering this final 5% and putting out great websites when they could probably get away with just a good or a decent website? Because uh, a good or a decent website has a very, very shorter shelf life. So this person is not going to, if you want people to keep your work and keep it for a long time and be proud of it for a long time, you need to think of it as a work of art. You need to think of it as a painting. It's something that they're going to stick on their wall and be proud of. That's the 5%. If you put something out there that kind of people are finding niggles in, um, you know, a month after having it, it's kind of, you know, you get a new pair of trainers and you think, brilliant, love my new pair of trainers. And then there's a little bit of dirt on them. And then, you know, the, the sole starts creeping away. And, you know, it's not long before you, you buy a new pair. You buy cheap, you buy twice. If you generally want to deliver value to your clients, take that extra 5%. And it will come back to you in, in you know, in folds. It, will, it really will. So if somebody's kind of looks at your site and you've taken that time to put that last 5% piece of effort in, um, you're going to find the work that you get off of the back of that will just kind of make it worth that 5%. The fact that you can then kind of put 10% on your charges, 20%, 30% on 
of it's not uncommon and it's not unheard of within the Divi community to hear of people doubling their, their fees in mm -hmm. a very short space of time because they know that putting that last 5% in is going to make all the difference and people are going to be willing to throw money at you. You know, literally, here, take my money, take it all, build me something that you do, you weird wizard man. You know, and, and, and people do. And I think that's the difference between a 95% complete site and a 100% complete site. Sounds like a good answer to me. SJ, thank you so much for coming on Divination. Thank you very much for having me.